All right, I finally got it put back together. This Zenith Data Systems Super Port that I took apart in the previous video, did a teardown of it. And before I turn it back on to see if it still works, I figured I would make some clarifications and go into some details of its specs and, and that kind of stuff using a slightly more modern computer. Now this website, Terminus.tzo.com, seems to be the leading resource for everything you need to know about this computer, about this Zenith Data System Supers port. Somebody was kind enough to put up all this information a long time ago, I think starting in 2002. And you can see the last update for the homepage, 2004. A couple of these links were last updated in 2011. So I don't know if this guy is still updating it, but this is a very helpful resource. Let's look at the Supers port manuals. Now that's something I should have looked at before I started tearing it down, or at least while I was tearing it down. And here you can see all there's all the different specs. So there we go. The microprocessor is indeed the 8088. And depending on one on the dip switch setting, it could be operating at 4.77 megahertz or 8 megahertz. And there is that optional 8087 data coprocessor. There's that 640 megabytes of, or 640 kilobytes of RAM that we saw. And the specs for the monitor. And as for the drives, the hard drive is 20 megabyte capacity. And the floppy drive, 720 kilobyte capacity. So that's why it wasn't reading the first disk that I shoved in there to try to install that program, because that was installed for... 1.44 megabyte and um, 720 kilobyte is the maximum capacity on this thing's drive. Although when I did format a new disk, I think I formatted this one, it formatted as 360 kilobyte. So maybe I can try an MS-DOS handle to format a 720 kilobyte rather than a 360, which, which may be a default. And here's the power supply rating, 18 volt DC, 3.2 amp maximum. So it doesn't really have to be a fancy regulated 12 volt exactly power supply. It could, could be over a wide range because the internal power supply circuit board inside there takes care of the regulation. And here's another thing, battery. Now I noticed it early on, and you may have noticed it too, there was no battery inside this beast. And um, I was quite surprised about that. But apparently it does have capacity for a battery, 12.5 volt NICAD battery pack, removable. And that is depicted, there it is. So you see that's a picture of the back of the computer right there. And then the battery pack um, gets attached with a, cut with a bunch of hooks going through some holes here on the back of the computer. This whole thing is the battery pack and there's a slot underneath there for all the different port connections. So here's where the battery would have hooked up on these two holes and these other two holes here. And I guess it would have had a plug that plugs directly into the, the DC inlet. And then of course there's a, you know, a, a space, a slot underneath the battery for all those ports to go through. So that was the service manual we were looking at before. Now let's have a look at the user manual, which I've already started downloading. And you can see here it's a whopping 55 megabytes with 4 hours and 23 minutes expected download time. Of course, that's for a 28.8 .8 kilobyte modem. So it's certainly going to be a lot quicker than 4.5 hours on this thing. But in any event, it is neatly divided into individual sections of the the full manual each one is an individual file for a much quicker download time how convenient here we go super support portable computer user technical manual 203 pages on this thing and it's got all the basic stuff that was typical manuals of the day computer manuals where it tells you all the things about floppy disks and how to load them in the computer and all the different connections and everything and oh yeah, one more thing. The switches that we saw, 
on the bottom of the of this beast right there that is the bios that dip switch is the bios that has all the setup configurations that could possibly be there is no program that you can just push f2 or delete or something like that to uh, bring up the bios program during startup eight pin dip switch that's the bios i i i was really surprised when i found that out i think this is the first computer i ever used that had uh, an 8088 or or rather anything that didn't have an x86 microprocessor in it here's some more awesome stuff it actually shows you how the data is stored on the floppy disk and the hard disk how it's written and read it's awesome stuff here's some stuff on the modem could be 1200 or 2400 bowed none of this 56k rubbish as dave jones would say and here we get into the hardware of the computer looking at some power supply stuff disk drive power 5 volt and 12 volt dc and power levels are monitored by the low voltage detection circuits that's probably referring to one of those that the little 8 pin ic for the power monitoring that we saw on the hard drive and i think i saw one on the motherboard as well and then here's information for the backlight power supply that electroluminescent panel 750 hertz ranging from 20 volts to 80 volts ac and then it starts getting into microprocessor here the 8088 and all these all these uh, internal registers everything you need to know if you want to program this thing with assembly and one last note about this manual here is the stuff it goes into with just how the LCD works. It goes into the nitty gritty detail of polarizing voltages and all that stuff with uh, the d two sides of the LCD and the 640 by 200 pixel matrix and all that kind of stuff. It's I've never seen any kind of computer user manual so detailed as this one. And it looks like I'll have to try this. It says use the function 8 or function 9 key to change the grayscale. I wonder what kind of change it's going to produce. Anyway, have a look at this website. I'll include a link down below. It's got lots of awesome stuff. Thank you, whoever put this up. I couldn't find the, the author's name anywhere on here. But he's got frequently asked questions and stuff I learned the hard way all kinds of really good stuff if you if you actually have one of these computers and you want to get it working and learn everything about it this is the resource to go all right let's see what happens i got the 7 or the 12 volt power supply turned on let's turn on the computer and i got brightness turned all the way up and the the room lights are dimmed Oh man, there goes the hard drive. Nothing on the monitor yet. Oh. So yeah, that's the hard drive working and then the floppy drive just did something to see if anything was there. Here we go, starting MS-DOS. Can't really see that very well. There we go. Again, I got to enter the date and the time. And there we go. Looks like it's doing good. EIR. Everything's still there. I wonder what that FN8 and FN9 does to the contrast. Let's try that. No. Maybe this one. F8, F9. Nothing's working there. Now in the first video we saw that the monitor just turned off by itself and I think that's just because it has a, a screensaver mode after a minute or two and I'm sure I could reset that if I looked into it in the manual. But let's see how the floppy disk is doing. This is the one I already formatted to 360 kilobytes. Let's see if we can format this thing to format A colon and uh, 
F colon 720. It doesn't like that. Hmm. Time to bring out my Toshiba T440C. This is another beast I've had for a while now, for a few years. It's got a nice color LCD display. Let's see if I can remember how to turn the damn thing on. It's got a push button right here on the left. There we go. Look at that. It's counting the memory. What was that? A whopping two megabytes, I think, there. On this Toshiba, the MS-DOS program has a very handy-dandy help menu. And here we can see the, the help menu for the format disk, format stuff here. And I think I just got my syntax wrong the first time. It should be a slash F colon file size 720. And we'll see if this one actually likes that. Format A colon slash F. There we go. Oh, parameters not compatible. I don't know what's going on here. Now here's that MS-DOS screensaver. I got it shown on the Toshiba right now and I wanna see if I can put it on a floppy disk on it that's formatted for 360 kilobyte and see if the Zenith will actually read it and run the program. Well, I guess it worked. Let's stick it in the other machine here. A colon. Razdaz. Oh man, doesn't like that. EGA or VGA required. I think this monitor is a CGA. Program error 42. Press any key to continue. Well, I guess it's just not going to work on this old Zenith computer here with this Razdaz program, which requires a minimum of EGA video standard. And you can see here, CGA has a 640 by 200 resolution. That's what that computer is set up for. And EGA, 640 by 350 resolution is the, apparently the minimum required for this program. But I do have another really old program, an old Pac-Man program that I have with, which doesn't require any really fancy video standard. Maybe that would work on this thing. And I also just want to show a close-up of the monitor of the LCD pixels. And you can see that the pixels are much taller than they are wider. And so that certainly explains the fact that we can get this 640 by 200 resolution with uh, with the monitor size that seems like it should be a four four by three aspect ratio but man those pixels are, I think are just a little too tall taller than they need to be and also all that grainy light blue coloring behind the the uh, the dark blue pixels which are activated that that's the electroluminescent material back there with the, the grainy pattern can't really see it well here but I can certainly see with my stereoscopic vision my own two eyes that the LCD pixels are elevated a little bit above the EL display background and over here on the right side of the display you can see how some of these pixels are starting to get a little discolored some of them are some of them are much bluer and some are kind of grayish colored or faded a little bit this thing is certainly showing its age all right to get pac-man on this machine i brought it to my lab at work and um first of all i should point out that i tried to connect an external monitor onto the back of it and i ended up messing up the display a little bit you can see that every 
eighth column on this thing has gone blank or some of them seem to have a an extra pixel that's lit up permanently and then there's or let me type in some Z's here you can see it's only it's only a portion of every eighth column that gets blanked out but on other sections here it looks like the entire column look at that S right there in serial but that's only for the bottom half of the display the top half is perfectly fine so I'm not sure what happened there but certainly this thing is on its last legs especially considering the condition of the the hard drive with those leaky capacitors and here's the daisy chain of converters and gender changers that I had to use to hook up the monitor it's no wonder it didn't work and to get the Pac-Man program on this machine I had to go a roundabout sort of way with a bunch of different computers first on my main office computer stored on USB take that USB onto this Dell Optiplex GX110 so I can copy that onto a floppy disk a 1.44 megabyte floppy disk because this thing doesn't like to to read or write to uh, 360 kilobyte so it only does the, the 1.4 megabyte take that 1.4 megabyte floppy over to this older Nexcom computer and then stick it in the floppy disk and then save it on the hard drive and then put a 360 kilobyte or yeah put a 360 kilobyte floppy into this machine save it onto there and finally I take that 360 kilobyte floppy with the Pac-Man program and I can stick it on this machine here so let's play this Pac-Man game and have some fun Alright, next level. So that's it. Pac-Man or PC Man as the official name for this program. I downloaded it online years ago. I'm not sure exactly where, but it might still be available. One final thing here. I want to flip switch number five to convert the display into 40 columns rather than 80 columns. And let's see what happens. Let's turn it on. Oh, I think I see what's happening here. I thought it was just going to occupy a little center portion of the screen, but I think what it's really doing is just spreading everything out and making the... It's going to make the letters look not so elongated, but more squarish. There we go. Oh man, that's awesome. Still got the problem with the with the columns being blanked out here on the bottom half of the screen and that's just but this time it's every fourth column instead of every eighth 
There you can clearly see the division between bottom half and the top half. Hey, I think I fixed it. After flipping it back into 80 column mode, it looks like there's no more blanked out columns. Look at that. Good as new. No idea why it was what happened there, but it seems to work fine now. So that's it. I think I've spent too much time on this thing already. It's been really fun playing around with it, but I'm going to be passing it on to one of our other faculty here who would like to have some of his own fun with this thing because it brings back fond memories of when he used to have a computer very similar to this back in his younger days.